Hi. Hi, and welcome to Jung at Heart. I am Deborah Henson Conant, and I'm here with Kathleen Wiley. And we meet every week, pretty much, um, with our harps um, to talk about life, music, and psychology. I am a composer and a performer, and Kathleen is a Jungian analysis, analyst, <laughs> and she'll tell you more about what that means. And today we're going to talk about musicality. What is it in our lives and what is it in music? We're doing something, an experiment today. We're also going live on Facebook and on YouTube at the same time as we're recording this. So I'll be sort of monitoring, trying to monitor those two feeds. So Kathleen, as we were talking this morning, as we always meet and then we say, you know, what do we want to talk about today? And there were two things that I wanted to talk about. And one was the idea of musicality. What is it? And the other was the idea of completion. At what point is something completed enough to share? And I thought they were two different subjects, but you started talking about them in a sense, how they exist together. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, good morning, everybody. I mean, one of the things, uh, DHC, that you say in one of your courses is you talk about bringing something to a point of completion, which means you're ready to share it with someone. And so when you brought those two topics up this morning, when I think about the musicality of life, I think about walking to the beat of your own drum, the beat of your own heart, and following the rhythm of your own nature, because we all have our own rhythm. We all, you know, some of, of us are morning people, some of us are night owls, but there are all kinds of ways that we each have our own rhythm. And so it occurred to me that that if we're talking about musicality and playing our harps or whatever your other instrument is, then the point of completion seems to me that would be the place at which, in this case, we'll say music, the music, the song, the tune has been shaped to where your expression of it in the playing allows the rhythm of your own heart and the musicality of your own nature to come through it. So that in a way, the song or the tune, if it's played through the musicality of the soul, is gonna have a nuanced difference in every different person's playing of it. So that perhaps completion and sharing has something to do when we've let the rhythm of our own heart and the beat of our own heart infuse. I keep thinking. I keep thinking of the words of the song of mine. Um, you gotta dance the way you dance to the rhythm of your own heart. You gotta close your eyes and listen till you hear it. Listen till you hear the music start, and then sing the way you sing. You know. So uh, and uh, that's it. Uh, that's it. <laughs> when I write songs like that, it's not necessarily that I know what that is, but that I'm looking for that in myself and that I'm going to be looking for that in my life over and over again in terms of what I'm doing and also in terms of what I'm trying to teach. Right. And, yeah, and, and I know, and so I'm teaching a class right now called The Nightingale, where I'm teaching a song of mine. And um, it is a beautiful song and it is a very simple song. And it can be done, let me just show you. Um, it can be done by people at any level, even, even a beginner. Let's see if I've got this. So it could be as simple as literally um, playing a single note. But let's put it in a different key, okay? That's easier to sing. Like I could sing, Who will sing for the night in game? When the night is gone, when the daylight comes. So literally a person who had never played the harp before could play and sing this song because it's, it's so simple. You say, start on this note, go down to this note, come back up. And then it can also be, who will sing for the night in the night is gone. And they're complete at each level. And even if someone doesn't want to sing, they can play the melody, but they could even just take the first part and tell a story with it. And that also is complete. 
it's complete at every single level if people believe that it's complete. And that is the trick. If they can connect with the completion within them, it can be complete at any point. Yes, and what you're saying is both of those that you just shared had a beautiful musicality because they expressed your own heartbeat. You just, <laughs> they expressed your own heart and your heart came through. The beat of your heart was right. in it. And so that we're talking really about getting away from the notion that musicality has anything to do with complicate, being complicated. And we're also getting away from the idea that for something to be complete to share, it has to be complicated and complex. Right, right. That when in, in truth, our rhythm, our own rhythm is like our heartbeat. It's very simple. If you just tune in right now to your heartbeat, Okay, I totally get that. And whenever somebody says, like I was talking to someone about writing the other day and they were like, well, just keep it simple. And I was like, you know, if I knew how to keep it simple, I would. But, but I feel like, uh, you know, part of what my job is with, with students is to help them find the simplicity because mm -hmm. we don't know it. We don't know where it is or how to connect with it. So we don't know when something's complete. We, you know, I know that when I'm working on something, I'll get it to a point that I, from when I was here, I thought that was complete. I'll get there, but that's opened up a whole new vista of what complete could be. And so I often then don't share it at the first level of completion because I feel like, well, and it's stuck in stone and people would be like, that's that. Right. Well, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm thinking about as, as um, you're talking and, and we're talking about musicality and rhythm and um, moving to the beat of one's own drum, so to speak, one's heart. I'm also thinking about the rhythms of nature and how there's never really a completion in the sense of there being an end product that if we look at the tides, for instance, you know, there's high tide and low tide and all of the various stages in between, but there's the completion of a cycle, but there's never the completion meaning that those rhythms stop. And perhaps part of what you're describing is that if we're living in the flow of our life, and I believe this is true in our music as well as in our life everywhere, then this idea of completion isn't much, it, it isn't a static point where something's finished and put up on the shelf, but it's more like the completion of a cycle. Then we go to the next cycle. Or sometimes I use the analogy of the spiral staircase. We go around one rung on the ladder. Now we're going around another rung. And so in that regard, the completion also honors the rhythm of the life force, which is pulsating, which is constant movement. It's not, it doesn't stop. Well, then how do we, how do we, at what point, and maybe this is the, at what point do we share? Like, at, at what point do I share a piece of music? Or at what point, well, I, I mean, if I were to say to my students, I would say that the trick is not um, how do you get it to the point of where you think completion is, but that the trick is how do you, how do you sink into it? That means, how, how do you, um, break it down to the point that it is simple enough that you could share your life with it now. You could share who you are with it now. Like, do you think that there's ever anything where we couldn't take it down to a form that was so simple that we could share our lives with it now? Uh, meaning, meaning like, seriously, if you got a harp and you'd never played a harp before or, or clarinet or whatever it is you, you could share your experience at any point like if this was a clarinet and I just got it I could share my experience of the clarinet the mm -hmm. first moment I got it the first moment I was taking it apart and what would be 
the value of that. I, I believe there's a value in that, but what is that value? Well, I mean, the value may be different for each person given the situation, but I think one of the things that there's an inherent value always in sharing is that we then get mirrored back. That if we share, then what comes back to us gives us an image, a reflection of ourself. And in this case of uh, perhaps our relationship to our instrument. You know, I, I, the minute you started saying that, I immediately the picture came into my mind of that the three blind men and the elephant, which is supposedly, yes. par the parable is supposed to show you, you know, that I don't know what it's supposed to show you, but, um, but, but I believe, so, and one, you know, to, to, what, to touches the trunk and says, oh, a, an elephant looks like a snake, and one touches the tail, and, or I don't know what they are, an elephant's like a hose, oh, and then one touches the tail, and oh, an elephant's like a rope, and other whatever. And I think the parable is supposed to be, you're wrong. You know, the elephant is much more than that. But I mean, to me, the parable is we all only have a certain part of the elephant that we can see at any one time. And if we do share that and listen to each other and share our blindness, mm -hmm. we are, we, we each have a perspective that will lead to a depth of you know, a commune, communal perception. Why do I think this is a Jungian concept? Why do I think there's something exactly like that, like a name that you said? What is it? They're like the, the... Well, Jungian psychology very much is about living into the wholeness. It's not about perfection, and it's really not about completion, but it's about wholeness. It's about how do we make room for all aspects of ourself, the aspect of ourself that might be like the tail of the elephant and the aspect of ourself that might be like the big old belly and, you know, whatever those qualities, traits, characteristics and desires are. And, you know, maybe to kind of playing with your, um, your wondering about when is something ready to be shared? When is it complete enough? Perhaps it has something to do with when you feel it embodies one of some aspect of yourself that you're ready to share because you know sometimes we need to spend time seeing ourselves and being with that aspect of ourself before we're ready to bring it out for someone else's eye or bring it out publicly I, I, I hear you and, and now I'm totally taken with this idea that if we're exploring something and we're sharing our exploration now I'm thinking of all those, you know, whenever an explorer goes out in the world and they're writing, writing back, I mean, what are those accounts? Yes. They, they have, they, this is the first day they ever saw that part of the Nile or something like that. Mm -hmm. And they're sharing that with us. It's like an adventure into the wilds of whatever, the adventures into the wilds of a, I mean, honestly, it's like the adventures into the wilds of, of being alive. I mean, who really knows? And yet we, I get that we think that we have to get to a certain level. And, and, and certainly in, when I'm teaching creative resonance, practice and having a practice mm -hmm. is a huge part of connecting with your musicality and your self-expression. But it certainly doesn't mean that it's not valuable to others and to yourself to start sharing from the moment you step into the experience. Absolutely. Yeah. But there has, but I believe there has to be something in that, like, because I've seen people express musicality with almost no skill. And I have seen people not express musicality with a great deal of skill. And so there has to be something that has to do with the connection of self and of self to what we're doing that brings in musicality or you know self expression so tell me what what is that <laughs> well for me it, it informed by all of my own spiritual studies and my training and work as a jungian psychoanalyst for me that is the heart connection you know, Jung says that, that if we really knew that there are three centers of consciousness in the body, 
there's a center of consciousness in the head, center of consciousness in the heart, and center of consciousness in the gut. And for those of you who are out there who wonder why he said that, he wrote that in one of his lectures to the Swiss Technical Institute in Zurich. And when, um, when did you write that about? about uh, that, I want to say it was in the 50s, but don't quote me. It could be in the 30s, but okay, right. <laughs> if you're interested. In the mid 19th century. Yes, yes, it, it, 20th century, yeah. Um, and if you want the specific reference, email me or DHC and, and I'll get it for you. And by but, that, um, can you just, you mean Carl Jung, and can yes. you give a very, very brief of who he was for just a second? Yeah. Context? Um, Carl Jung was a Swiss psychiatrist who um, lived um, at the, really in the early 1900s. He was born in the late 1800s. And he, um, you know, Freud was the grandfather of psychoanalysis because he discovered the unconscious, which meant that he realized that there's something far more um, in charge of who we are than our rational um, conscious self and our minds. Remember, we were kind of coming off of the industrial um, revolution and this whole sense that we could, as humanity, conquer nature. We again realized we couldn't, <laughs> that there was something else going on. And so um, Jung and Freud differed on some main points. One of the most we all, you know, some of, of us are morning people, some of us are night owls, but there are all kinds of reaper for what I was saying. And so it occurred to me that that if we're talking about musicality and playing our harps or whatever your other instrument what is. is, then but let me see if I can figure out where I don't know what that was. I'm thinking it was the live jumping in. Did you hear that? I did hear that. So the live would be a delay from what it is we were talking about because that was kind of the Quite beginning. delayed, yeah. Okay, yeah. well, it's an experiment and we're sharing it. <laughs> so, <laughs> if it happens again, we'll, we'll jump in. That's right. <laughs> All right, so you were talking about Jung, Carl Jung. Thank you. And what was I saying about Jung? <laughs> well, he was doing something in the 50s, and, or, or possibly the 30s, and he was talking about, well, I'm really interested. Okay, so there's three levels of consciousness in the head, the chest, and the gut. And yes, let's get back to that. So, yeah. so I was saying, this is what I was saying, I remember now, thank you very much, <laughs> that one of the most important differences between Carl Jung's theory and Freud's theory was that Jung very much believed that our libido is the life force. That for Freud, the libido was the sexual instinct and how that played out. Jung said it's far bigger than that. It's the life, it's the life force that flows through us. So for Jungian analysis, the 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 goal of analysis or working from a Jungian perspective is what Jung called individuation which means embodying and living the fullness of who you are as a unique spark of God. So it was very much about living into the fullness of who you are, me living into the fullness of who I am, each of our viewers li li living into the fullness of who they are, their true nature. And so that when we talk, go back to this idea of, again, musicality and completion and this difference between someone who may be a total beginner and they can play something with such heart and someone who has all these technical skills, but it's flat, the difference is the presence of the heart. The mind is there. They've learned the technique they've studied, even if the technique is to pluck the one string. Then their gut is there, they're embodying what they feel, and then it's filtering through the heart. What do they want to express emotionally? For me, musicality and emotion or felt sense join together. If we're going to follow the flow of our own psychic energy, then we have to be in tune with what's happening in our heart. What's going on for us emotionally, what's going on for us in terms of our own felt experience. And for me, the term felt experience means that we sense something in our gut, we have sensations in our body, our head kicks in with ideas about what that is and images about what that is, and then our heart synthesizes them. And we then have an understanding that sometimes an image holds 
are thought holes, but there's an understanding and a connection to something that lives within our own body mind. Okay, so um, uh, there's a whole bunch of things I want to get there. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I want to go back to something that I don't want to forget. Um, but but I also so when you said when that's happening, it sounds like the head can definitely get a problem in there. Can <laughs> stop it because if the head is thinking certain things it's going to stop the flow of the energy absolutely and if that if those thoughts are also connected to um trauma or pain or something in in the in the gut that's that's held there then it's going to be even a stronger resistance and if the heart is in pain then that's, you know, so it can all get cut off. And I think that's also why when we are able to heal any parts of those, they start healing all the rest of it. And then our self-expression starts coming out. Um, wow. And so that's why it's so important to go in your practice, to go back to something simple that you can do and, and really um, sink into the beauty of what you love about that. Yes. And, and I'm realizing that's one of the powers of this particular song or any song that's simple and beautiful because it lets you do that. And it lets you go back to that place over and over again as your Te technical ability or your coordination is really what it is, mm -hmm. um, expands. And coordination is just that you're able to bring in more com complexity in a self-expressed way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, so practice isn't so much about pushing yourself as about bringing new, so now I'm seeing this pot, this pot mm -hmm. of beautiful, you know, the beautiful you that's being stirred. And as you put, you know, one new ingredient into it and it becomes part of that, that um, flavor of who you are. Uh, what did I just say? Was that, what was that about develop? Oh, I forgot what I was just saying. Okay, so this is fascinating in terms of how we would go about practicing something, always going back, that's so interesting because I just see that I've been doing that in the class, going back to the basic and building up over and over and over again, not starting at the complex point, but starting at the simple point and building. Yes, and what you said um, four or five sentences ago, which I'm not gonna remember exactly, but when you do your practice and the practice becomes not a head-driven, mm -hmm. um, endeavor but a pr the practice becomes an opportunity for your head and your gut and your heart to all inform one another to where you're expressing something you're experiencing in the moment that you're expressing what is evoked in you in the moment because the head more than any part of us can get very one-sided. It's happy to go off on one direction. And so then everything else gets lost. But the musicality that we are drawn to and that are reasons that we have particular artists and songs we go back to over and over again are songs that we automatically play when we sit down by ourselves. It's because there's, there's a musicality in it that is the expression of our heart and our gut body and our intellectual experience. It's like, it's a place where we're in alignment and we feel when we're in alignment, there's this feeling state. I mean, it's a state of consciousness that we experience in body sensation and emotion and image. Yeah. You know what I'm talking no, about? As you're, yeah, I do. And I'm thinking that there are songs from my childhood that I'm not even half done with those songs. <laughs> and, and, and I'm embarrassed because I, not only do I love these songs, I make up new verses for them. And um, they may have been really irreverent songs, um, you know, at first, like I know the song, um, uh, 
wish I was an apple hanging on a tree. Every time my Cindy passed, she'd take a bite of me. Get along home. Oh, Cindy, Cindy, get along home. Cindy, Cindy, get along home. Cindy, Cindy, I'll marry you someday. Now, that is not the way. You know, I was taught the song, and that's not the original lyrics. Their lyrics are, I mean, those are the original, but the lyrics were things like, oh, Cindy had religion. She had it once before. She had it with the preacher's son right on the chapel floor. You know, so it was a completely irreverent song, but that's not how I experience it. I experience, I don't know what, but there's just so much in it, and it's embarrassing to me. And that goes for, um, oh, Susanna and... Um, you know, a lot of these songs, some of which are, I've actually, I'm even, um, I've been working on the railroad and I've had, you know, friends say, but that's like, a, that's a song about basically about in, in, indenture, you know, indenturehood. Um, and, but whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, and, but I feel like I connect to the people who've been singing this all their lives. I connect to the people who did work on the railroad. I connect to the fact that they, you know, here, this woman in Massachusetts playing a harp. Um, but I feel like I do make that connection and I'm embarrassed about it. I'm embarrassed about loving something. So loving something at the point that if I'm alone, I will sing it in, in, in such a heart way as though I'm trying to connect to something that's distance in time and space. Well, they're soulful. I mean, I think DHC, what you just shared with us in, in your version of Get Along Home, Cindy, Cindy, is one of the reasons that song has survived over the decades. I mean, all those three songs you just named, we all grew up singing and they're classics. Uh, you know, my husband who teaches all the folk string, they're songs he's always teaching his students because they're heartfelt. They have something of the human experience that resonates in us. So that musicality also has something to do with the expression of something that's universal, that resonates in yeah, all of us. I'm also realizing that it, as you say this, that these songs, and probably all songs, but certainly these, have been over time just like you know, a, a sign that might have been painted a certain way has been stripped away over time and is down to the wood. You know, mm -hmm. um, that they've been stripped of their stylistic um, constraints. So I could take that same song and, you know, make it as a bossa nova. I wish I was an apple hanging on a tree. Every time I send a pass, she take a bite of me. We're gonna get along home, Sandy, Sandy, gotta get along home, Sandy, Sandy, get along home, Sandy, Sandy. You know I'm gonna marry you, I'm gonna marry you, I'm gonna marry you someday. I could just, you get to have as much fun because it's not, it's not, um, oh, how do you say that? It's, it's, it's not saying what its style is. It's open to interpretation in, in any way, like, um, uh, I mean, I suppose you could put it into, you know, like a Mozartian, um, <laughs> I don't know. So, yeah. Well, but, and, but what you're saying, DHC, is that for you, because you have that connection in your heart, gut, and head with the basic tune, that it doesn't get caught in a static form right. that does that lacks musicality, that the connection you have to the basic tune allows you to tap into any given moment in time and space where you are with the people you're with, if you're with people, and express some resonance of the human experience. And that's what makes it, um, that's what makes it alive. 
that's what makes it touch you, makes it touch me, makes it touch our listeners. You know? If you were going to take what you learned today, because you were <laughs> the harp also, and you were going to say, all right, yeah, with whatever technical ability I have, I am going to find a part of myself in this song today, mm -hmm. in a song. How would you go about, as a Jungian <laughs> analyst, but seriously, how would you go as a Jungian analyst, go about it as a Jungian analyst, how would you go about it as a musician, and how is that different? It isn't. It isn't different. Because tapping into our core self is the same process whether we're doing it to play a song at the harp or we're doing it to make a decision about the job we're going to take or we're doing it to make a decision about how we structure our day. It really has to do with having developed the muscle, which comes from having a practice of, of some kind that helps us develop an awareness of what's going on in our head and our heart and our gut and how they're affecting each other simultaneously and how they're informing one another. And in the process of having that practice of tuning into that, we then also learn to develop discrimination or discernment. Discernment is really the better word. We discern, okay, is, is my head trying to shut down what my gut wants because at some point my heart got hurt because I was shamed for wanting that or expressing that? So we begin then to discern what these different energy centers are telling us. And we can make a conscious choice about where we want to put our focus and attention and to use the analogy, the fire we want to flame, the, the, the fire we want to stoke, you know, the spark we want to fan to get bigger. And what I find with my heart is when I can sit down, even if I'm doing like a warm up exercise or a technique practice, if I can start by tuning in to all three of those energy centers and what it is I want to experience with my heart that day, then a simple warm-up exercise can become something that sounds very beautiful and heartfelt versus something that sounds mechanical and rote. So it is the quality, if we want to use the word, it's the quality of consciousness that we bring. Consciousness meaning that felt sense and awareness of what's going on inside of us. And again, at this moment, these three energy centers are a great way to begin thinking about that or to think about it throughout the day. It, it kind of simplifies it. You know, if we check in with the head, heart, and gut, then we're going to get all of the basic functions of our being. Well, I, what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing is that we, we then bring all three parts of us into what we're doing. Yes. We open up those centers. And um, I know that as, um, you know, someone who can have like what I call alien orientation syndrome, which is just like, <laughs> well, I don't know, um, I would... I would say to myself, if I was asking this question, I would go back to the strings of passion or the, or the principles of creative mm -hmm. resonance. And I would say, um, check, I would check in with those, th them being, what is my impulse? What is the form or structure of this? So impulse, structure, mm -hmm. character, what character am I trying to express? Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily, all of them would not be available, but what are the roles here? What are you know, how is the music working? What's the bass line? What's the melody? Because once I can see those, that differenti differentiation, then the, the, the parts of the music can talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Or I can leave out a part if I, if I can identify those. And then the fifth string is the string of practice, um, where I'm doing that and I'm bringing myself to the practice, allowing to simplify it enough that the practice can get to me. Um, then I might be bringing in deconstruction, which is what I'm doing right now, break, breaking it down, or looking at what I'm doing and saying, this is too much. How can I do this much? Mm -hmm. How can I break it down either to less in the moment or less over time? And then finally experiencing, being, being willing to experience liftoff, mm -hmm. that moment of when I let go. There are other practical things that I've learned recently that seem to happen over and over again in music. And those are there, so they're kind of a, a, an overlay of four or five other principles, which is distilling, which is kind of like deconstruction. Mm -hmm. So bringing something down to its simplest form, 
expanding it. So when you're building a chord, you go down to the root of it, mm -hmm. you expand it up with all its members, then you can alter it, <clears throat> so you can change any part of it. You can substitute one part for another. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, sim simplify or distill, expand, alter, substitute, and then progression, which is how you put things together. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that helps other people, but for me, it helps me to either mechanically, I think that the second five principles are mechanical principles. Mm -hmm. how, how do you work with this stuff? And the first seven principles are um, maybe principles of focus. I'm not sure I'm still exploring all that. And so I just, I, it helps me to have these things to look at and pick e you know, one of them. So if I were to make a picture of today, I would make a picture on one side of sort of the spiritual psyche and mm -hmm. I would like a heart, you know, a head, heart um, and gut. And how does that reach over to what I'm doing? And then on the other side, I would have the seven principles and maybe the five and, you know, just so that I would have a way into all this. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking about what you said, the five, uh, the, the distill, distill, expand, alter, substitute, and what was the fifth? And, and then progress, put them together. Progression or integration. Those are all alchemical processes. There are alchemical processes that Jung said are indicative of what we have to do psychologically to become more whole. So, okay, <laughs> this is what, I, okay, I want to put a pin in that because I know <laughs> our time is almost up. I want to talk about that next time. Okay. Alchemical principles, those, and, and uh, you know, how, however I've stumbled on them through music yes. and how he's, he's brought them in. I would love that. Yeah, because one of the things that we have to do is the distillation is we have to be able, again, to discern, to break things down to their basic essence, their most fundamental essence, their root in music. But it's also the root in us, which in our psyche is always some emotional state. It is, a, it is an experience. It's not a thought. It's an emotion. It's a strong affect, feeling state. That's where we've got to get it distilled down to that. Then we can begin to expand on that and see, okay, where does that lead us in terms of thoughts, behavior patterns, memories, desires? So you're talking about building reality. This is how we build reality. Exactly. But it's an automatic unconscious process that goes on all the time. But as we build a conscious relationship to ourselves, we can then begin to track it, influence it. And then it's kind of like knowing the currents of the river. You know, you can better figure out how to get where you want to go. <laughs> you know? and, you, and maybe you've got an inner navigation system to help you with that. Yes, you do. Wow. Yes, you do. Okay, well, I, I would love to go on for two hours right now, but this was... Great. And what I love about this is we were talking about completion and musicality, and I've experienced in this session exactly what I experience about completion, is that whenever you do reach a completion, and I feel like we have, it right. opens the door. That is where the door opens yeah. to the next. And so it's exactly where I feel we've gotten. Yeah, it's so, beautiful. Wow. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. I have no idea if it actually got to YouTube and, and Facebook, but I'm really glad that we you know, did that experiment as well. Yes. And um, thank you, Kathleen. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you again next week. Yes. See you then. Bye-bye. <laughs>